Ronald Reagan was reelected president. Tigers won the World Series. I think the Raiders won the Super Bowl. And Tom and I graduated from high school. Which of those is the most important? We all know. Welcome to episode four of season five of Third Song In. Today, we're going to be talking about a year that holds a special place in all of our hearts, 1984. Also the year where we first heard the words, where's the beef on TV? <laughs> I think that's the most important thing to remember. Are you kidding me? How did I miss that? <laughs> I told you to find fun facts and you found the best fun fact there ever I was. found a fun fact. I did. Son of a bitch. I also, here's here's what I found. Popular fashions for men. Let me know if you wore any of these things. <laughs> Hawaiian shirts, Levi 501 jeans, flannel shirts, parachute pants, muscle shirts, and leather jackets. Well, I did not wear parachute pants or leather jackets. I could probably wish I probably wish that I could have, but I didn't. I wore the 501 jeans. That was, was it for me. Say, yeah, I, maybe I, that. Uh, I don't. I probably wore a flannel shirt. No, you know what? What I wore was the. Uh, I, what I was all into were the. Uh, well, first off, I went to a Catholic school, so I wore what they told me to wear. But when <laughs> I wasn't in school, I wore the you know the big old rugby shirts, like the collared, like yes. those big stripes. I feel like that was back then too. That was kind of popular. Yeah, for me too. I I would say because I was trying to remember what I wore because I I know it was just jeans, jeans and high tops. I remember that. Uh, and just like, you know, regular Converse high tops or, or maybe Nikes. Uh, I can't remember a shirt I wore other than that. I think you're right. Rugby shirts with like the rubber buttons on the. On yes, the exactly. Thing. The rubber buttons. Yeah. Uh, and I don't. And then just T-shirts with that said stupid shit on them. But uh, I didn't wear Hawaiian shirts. Definitely didn't wear muscle shirts or parachute yeah. pants and couldn't afford a leather jacket. So. No, same, same way. So this is how far I came. So 1980. I assume we both entered high school. I remember uh, going to football practice and two seniors, or uh, they might have been juniors, uh, drove me back and forth. So I lived in a school that didn't really have a district, no buses, all that stuff. So you had to um, get to school one way or another. So I had these two upperclassmen drive me, and I went to my first practice, uh, hopped in the car with them, and I used to wear the white tube socks all the way up to my knees. Uh, sneakers yep. and even worse is I would wear the they'd have three stripes like red you know blue red blue right you know whatever and so I remember distinctly because this stuck in my head because those fuckers made fun of me I had green yellow green stripes on my tube socks which are all the way up to my knees and then I had a green and a yellow matching you know shorts and t-shirts they were just brutal. Like they were just like, <laughs> how long did it take you to match that? Did your mom pick your clothes out? And I went. I went home and I was probably near tears. And I told my mom that I was never wearing tube socks again. And she had to go get me, you know, short socks. And that's been like to this day. Like I'm wearing short socks right now. I've never yep. worn anything but fucking short socks because of those fuckers that made fun of me. Well, and even I would wear longer socks, but it was the stripes. You had to get rid of the stripes. And yeah. I don't think I figured that out until college, by the way. I think I was still wearing <laughs> stupid uh, striped uh, gym socks until uh, until I got to college. And then somebody made fun of me. No, I was a big old doof. I mean, I was, I was uh, riding in the car with them. The two upperclassmen were in the front seat. I was in the back. It was a little like Pinto or something. Like, it was so uncomfortable in the back seat. And then the first guy gets dropped off. And he's like, hey, you want to hop in the front seat, Chris? I'm like, no, I'm good. So I just sat, I just sat in the back seat while the guy's driving me to my house. It had to be so uncomfortable for him. Uh, but but here's yeah. the question: When by the time 1984 came around, were you that guy? Were you making fun of the freshman who was wearing oh, those stripes? I'm quite sure I was. <laughs> and I I was driving people around in my big old brown like Malibu station wagon. Nice. Um, it was sweet, baby. I had a, uh, <laughs> I was driving a green, uh, 
Uh, Mercury, I think, Bobcat, Catchback. Boy, Bobcat. I, yeah, the chicks love the Bobcat, man. They really, really, that really and pulled a lot of babes. I'm not looking at uh, at fun facts here, but it's around that time that the Pacer came out. Remember that big, wide-ass, whatever it was? Yeah, definitely know, early 80s. I remember that, too. And, and I remember the, the commercial, they would show them making the huge sub in the back because it was so wide that you could make up <laughs> that monster sub. That, that, was the, that was the big draw. That was the big <laughs> yeah. selling point on the face. Yeah, because you are often making a sub in the back of your car with the uh, tailgate up. Really want to carry that party sub width-wise in your car wherever you were going. It was very important you could do that. But what I do remember also, I don't even know if they make cars like this anymore, but that Malibu, the Boo, had the seats facing backwards, like in the oh. back of the station wagon. So when we were kids, my sister and I'd sit back there on big road trips and uh, wave at people behind us, you know. The uh, the way, way back, they used to call, I remember they go, yep. or actually, I just remember that's the name of a great movie uh, that we talked about <laughs> once a while ago, The Way, Way Back. <laughs> All right, so in a little bit more seriousness, 1984 uh, was a fantastic year for pop culture. I don't even think I remember how significant it was. Uh, we had it pretty good. I mean, if you look at the list of top albums, uh, Prince released Purple Rain. This is just the top five albums from that year. Prince's Purple Rain, Springsteen's Born in the USA, Madonna's Like a Virgin, Run DMC's self-titled release, and Van Halen's 1984. After that, you got Unforgettable Fire by U2. I mean, those six albums are monumental. I mean, those are fantastic, influential albums. And 1984 was, I think, the last, maybe in the last one they did with, uh, what's his face, David Lee Roth. I can't remember. But yeah, I don't remember huge. that either, but that... Yeah. God damn, did you hear the, those songs, the songs from 1984? Because that was Jump, right? That was Jump yep. and, and all. Of, man, there must have been eight songs off that album. that I were know, just. It was, it was just they would just play uh, uh, Van Halen songs. I don't know if you were listening to the FM radio where where I was in 1984, I was in Dubois, PA. That I had moved there just Christmas the year prior and, uh, you know, going into my senior year and you turn on the. Uh, you turn on the radio and it was every other song was a Van Halen song. I swear to God. And I wasn't really into Van Halen. I just shows that my uh, lack of affinity for popular bands uh, went all the way back to 1984. Um, but if you go further into the list, you got albums by the pretenders, um, Husker do Metallica, mm. the Smiths, uh, the replacements. I mean, it was a really great wow. year for important, influential albums. Uh, Los Lobos had How Will the Wolf Survive? I remember buying that one. Yeah, you know, it's funny. A couple of those uh, albums you're talking about, I didn't discover until I got to college. And, you know, yeah. they came out when I was a senior. But again, I was kind of locked into Top 40 Radio and you know, whatever they were playing at the high school dance, which was, uh, as I said, like, you know, definitely Van Halen, definitely Prince from from that album. But some of that stuff was even, you know, I don't know, I won't say better, but certainly excellent music that I didn't even find out about until I was like a freshman or sophomore in college. Oh, yeah. Same thing. Like, and I distinctly remember a buddy of mine who was just kind of weird. And uh, he so I went to Catholic school, all, all boys school. Uh, lunch was when we, you know, shot the shit and uh, also got to see people's weird eating habits. So this guy would uh, get fries all the time for lunch and put mayonnaise on him, which I thought was the weirdest fucking thing. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a he was a good guy. I ended up staying friends with him for a long time. But I remember him coming to school and talking about a new album by the band, a band called Rat. And oh Jesus, I, he's the one to blame. <laughs> yeah, Son exactly. of a, who is that motherfucker? I want his <laughs> address. Yeah, I'll send you his <laughs> Facebook link. You can send him nasty <laughs> nasty grams. But I didn't like it. I was like, man, that shit's weird. And I remember the first video that they did was not dark, but it was grimy because it had rats, you know, crawling over people and stuff. And had a woman sort of crawling in a, I don't know, it was a weird outfit. And it was, it didn't appeal to me at all. 
three years later, I probably thought that album was the greatest thing ever. But you, uh, not that you may have, yeah, you may have been the first person who played a song from rap for me. Although, again, Dubois PA, where I grew up, uh, not grew up, where I finished growing up, I guess. Yeah. It was kind of a heavy metal bastion. So I'm sure I heard rap my senior year because a bunch of the guys that I played football and basketball with were were metal fans. But uh, I never didn't like that stuff then. Don't particularly like it now, although at least I have a, an appreciation of it, uh, which I know came from you, because uh, as much as I would uh, inundate you with some of the, the, you know, the Springsteen and the top 40 stuff. Uh, we did listen to a lot of metal uh, that sophomore year, and Rat was amongst oh, yeah. the, the the bands. So the other area that I thought was spectacular, I didn't remember it, but I I do now, was with movies. And you highlighted some of the some of the um, highlight. You highlighted some of the highlights. Nice work, Tom. I did. I I, I kind of emphasized some of the emphasis. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I I did. I did look. <laughs> Uh, I was looking at film and, and just looked at what came out that year. And I, as with music, I didn't realize how many great films came out. And it was like every genre of film. You know, if you wanted drama, Amadeus came out in 1984, uh, Once Upon a Time in America, which is an amazing, amazing kind of gangster immigrant story. Uh, for There were a hundred great comedies, but, you know, two of my favorites were you know, Bachelor Party came out that year. Beverly Hills Cop came out that year. Uh, there were romantic comedies. Uh, Splash was, you know, that was my first uh, exposure to Daryl Hannah. And boy, did I want to see more Daryl Hannah. Although, <laughs> actually, you saw a lot of Daryl Hannah in that movie, the more I think about it. Yeah. Uh, Footloose came out that movie. It was another great, I, I call it a romantic comedy. I, I'm not sure exactly if that's the, the perfect genre to, to place that in. Uh, Body Double came out. That's a movie I didn't see in 1984, but did see when we got to, to college. That was really, that was like a noir uh, thriller movie that was really kind of sexy and hot. And uh, Sci-fi had Terminator, Last Starfighter, Star Trek Three, The Search for Spock, which was maybe one of the best of the Star Trek movies for the original cast. Uh, there was uh, weird, quirky, Indie stuff. Uh, this is Spinal Tap came out that year, which is a classic that, you know, at this point, yeah, I think at least in our generation, everybody knows that movie, but uh, it, it came out under the radar. And Repo Man came out that year. Uh, there's a great Jim Jarmusch movie called Stranger Than Paradise that came out that year. Uh, big blockbusters like The Karate Kid came out, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which was the sequel to the original uh, Indiana Jones movie. And, uh, and one note I made was, uh, another kind of, and it was really popular, but uh, if you were really into jingoistic propaganda, that was when Red Dawn came out. I oh, loved yeah. I loved the movie <laughs> Red Dawn, and it took me 10 or 15 years to realize that that was just basically like a recruiting movie for the army, for the military, because it was just so anti-Soviet, anti-Russian. It was crazy, anti-Cuban, but it was a lot of fun to watch. And uh, I think I saw that movie more than once in the theaters himself. But I mean, what a great year for films that even my kids know a lot of these movies. Now, sometimes it's just because there have been a million sequels to them, but they spawned, all these movies spawned sequels and reboots and remakes. And uh, it's, uh, it. I, I had forgotten just how much came out. And, and as I said, I don't necessarily think I saw all of those things in 1984, but over the next few years, I certainly did. And even if they didn't do, uh, inspire sequels, they certainly inspired copies. Like This is Spinal Tap was essentially the first mockumentary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, also inspired all kinds of quotes. Yes. This one goes to 11. Yes, that, that's uh, such a great movie. It is. All right. So what do you most remember from 1984 from your senior year? You know, 84 was a weird year for me because of that that move. I had lived in uh, the northern panhandle of West Virginia since, I don't know, since probably fourth or fifth grade. Gone to junior high in West Virginia, started high school in uh, uh, Moundsville, West Virginia. And Christmas of my junior year, I, we moved to Dubois, Pennsylvania, which wasn't that far away, but it might as well have been a whole different country. 
know, the reality is, is Du Bois, Pennsylvania is a very similar town to Wheeling, West Virginia and, and Moundsville, West Virginia. They were all working class towns. And the demographics were pretty much the same. Uh, we were all Pittsburgh Steelers fans. <laughs> You know, it, it, but one was on uh, about 45 or 50 miles from Pittsburgh to the west and south. Du Bois was about two hours east of Pittsburgh. But it was all, you know, it, they were they were more similar than I realized when I made the move. Because, you know, to move like that in high school was, uh, was it felt very abrupt. And it was kind of, you know, I won't say that, you know, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, uh, I was able to adapt to it and fairly quickly, but it still made my senior year kind of odd because I was going to school with people who had been uh, going to school together since grade school. And I was, you know, I never stopped being the new guy, even by the end of the, the school year when I graduated. So that's kind of what always stands out for me is I felt very out of place. Luckily, I was an athlete and played sports. So I met people quickly. I mean, I was, I literally was at indoor track practice the first day of school after Christmas break, my junior year. Like they, I was, you know, we, we used to practice in the hallways of the school and I was there. So I got to meet people right away and that helped a ton. Um, and then by the time my senior year came around, you know, I, I played football. So, and I, I knew most of those guys at that point. So I, I had a, a, a better comfort level. But I always, all of 1984 to me felt like I was adapting to a new situation and also at the same time uh, looking to go to college, trying to figure out where to go and worried about adapting to that new situation. So it was very, very much a period of upheaval for me personally. Um, and I did, frankly, spend a lot of time watching TV and, you know, doing stuff at home just because I didn't have these you know, locked down best friends for life kind of uh, people in my life there. Uh, I spent a lot of time on the phone talking to you know, people I knew who were back in West Virginia. So it was kind of a weird, weird year for me personally. So I was very different. Uh, not that I didn't watch a lot of TV, but for very different reasons. So I went to the same high school all the way through. I talked about the fact that um wasn't districted. So it was a private school and kids came from all over the Cincinnati, the greater Cincinnati area, including Kentucky, uh, Northern Kentucky. And so there was three of us who lived semi close enough to each other to hang out. So, you know, when I came home in the afternoons or the evenings, and even on weekends, I'd have to make really, you know, I'd have to be very specific about my plans. Like one of my buddies lived about 30 minutes away. So we'd always have to, you know, drive a good distance over to him. My other friend lived closer, but he worked all the time. So I'd come home and, and do the same thing. I'd watch TV and I didn't have people around me that I'd always hang out with. The other thing that I did is I started going through my senior slump. Um, I was a straight A student all the way through my second semester senior year. I got two B pluses and I didn't care because I was just done. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I ended up almost by happenstance going to Wash U because I don't even remember why I applied, but I remember when I got the uh, acceptance letter in the financial aid package, I ran downstairs. I'm like, I think I'm going to wash you. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me a really, I, I got into Notre Dame, got a tiny little package. Yeah, funny. No, no, hey, hey, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Not the Notre Dame part. <laughs> I got a small <laughs> financial aid package. Uh, that's why I didn't go to Notre Dame. They found out <laughs> I had a tiny package. Uh, but it, couldn't have worked out better. I mean, you and I met and several of my fraternity brothers and friends, and I met my wife and um, first wife. So couldn't be happier. And But I would argue that what you went through prepared you a lot better for college than what I went through because I was a very sheltered life. I didn't drink hardly at all until my senior year, only a little bit. Um, like I said, I didn't go out and do a lot of stuff. So when I went to college, like this whole new thing opened up to me and I took advantage of every freaking opportunity that I could in both good ways and bad ways. Yeah. Um, and I am who I am because of it, but it's a hard lesson to learn. And I think like you said you were much better prepared for it. So I was, I was fortunate to have you as a friend. Well, yeah, you know, it's funny. That was my college Entrance essay, you know, and way back then you basically had to write an essay for about every school you applied to. And uh, the one I used the most was a, a 
an analysis basically of the good and the bad of being the new kid all the time. Cause I, I figured it out once I, well, actually I figured it out before I wrote that essay that I averaged something like four years in any single school district from the time I entered, you know, grade school until I graduated high school, we moved a lot. And, uh, it was tough. It was very tough. And that's, you know, I don't have really childhood friends. I can't tell you the name of, you know, a kid I went to first or second grade with, uh, and I can't tell you many of the names I pe of people I started high school with, a handful in West Virginia. But the the flip side of that was that you, at that age, with that kind of, you know, constant moving around, you do learn that you can make friends anywhere and that you can adapt to a new scenario uh, relatively quickly, at least at that age. I think it'd be harder for me to do it now, <laughs> but uh, it was it was a positive and I tried to look at it as a positive, and it did, I think, help me adapt to a completely new environment when we got to college uh, to some extent. You know, I talk to my kids about that because they have such a completely different experience. My kids have lived in the same house since the day they were born. And to some extent, I worried a little bit about that when, they, you know, they got older and, you know, my daughter went off to college. Uh, the um, I was a little worried about her, go, particularly because she went all the way across country. But she'd never lived anywhere else. And she'd grown up with the same people and had the same friends for her whole life. Uh, and it turns out she did perfectly fine. But it, it is a completely different situation than what mine was. Enough about us, even though this podcast is pretty much just about us and us talking about shit. Welcome, audience. <laughs> oh, there's an audience? <laughs> yeah, Holy I think shit. There might, there might be. If there Man. isn't, what, whatever. We'll keep recording. All right, so we talked about the high level of all the great pop culture. And what we've been doing in season five is for our recommendations, we make, make a recommendation from the spe a specific year. And this one, we've sort of writ large. We've taken that 1984, because it's the fourth episode of season five, so it'd be 1984. And, and this one, we decided we'd focus the entire episode on the year 1984. Um, so making these recommendations makes even more sense. So I went with a movie that I've probably seen five or six times. I don't really remember if it was popular. I mean, it was it certainly involved popular people, um, including a really well-known and important director, Francis Ford Coppola. But I chose 1984's The Cotton Club, um, which had Richard Gere, Diane Ladd, Gregory Hines, and many, many other folks. I know that um, Nicolas Cage was in it. Lawrence Fishburne played an early role. Um, James Remar uh, played a, a really important role in it as one of the gangsters. And this is definitely a gangster movie. But to me, it seemed to tie in to much more important themes there's sort of two parallel stories going on about two nightclubs um, one is the cotton club um, and i don't remember the other one um, but it's this um, separation between the white world and the black world and the white world um, has the fancy cotton club and all these important musicians and gregory hines sort of bridges the two worlds um, he's an amazing dancer in it, as he is in real life. Mm -hmm. um, and his goal is to get to the Cotton Club. And, um, and there's all kinds of other stories going on. Richard Gere's character is a horn player. He manages to save the life of this important uh, gangster. And so he's sort of taken into that world. And then he makes the mistake of falling in love with the gangster's girlfriend. I'd strongly encourage you to watch the movie. It's a long one back then. It was more than two hours. Nowadays, that's nothing. Um, but I think it's a fantastic portrayal of that period. There's a lot of gangster movies back then. Um, but I thought this one had some other aspects to it that made it um, well worth watching over and over again. And I did. And there's two great scenes that to this day, and the one stands out to me. I think about it all the time because of the way they interposed, I think that's a word. If it isn't, I don't care. I'd make up words. It's definitely a word. I think it is. It may not apply <clears> in this case. <throat> I'm not but... sure it's the right word, right? Yeah. So Gregory Hines' character is doing this great tap dance. And 
they go back and forth between his dancing and a hit that is performed on James Remar's character. Remar's character. Um, he's pissed off. He figured out that um, Richard Gere's character um, is after his girl and he's going to have him killed. Um, but he's pissed off some other gangsters. They're tired of his... They see him as a huge risk because he can't control his temper. So they send in two hitmen to kill him and his gang. Um, but the way they intersplice it between the dance scene and the murder, um, to me, is just one of the best scenes in movie history. I, I love that scene. And watched it on YouTube since. I sent it to Tom. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really great movie. So my recommendation 1984, for 1984 is The Cod Club. I'm embarrassed to say that I have never watched the Cotton Club. And I think it has to do, I just, I was looking at, uh, at it on IMDb and it's described as a musical crime drama. And I'm thinking <laughs> that may have been what turned me off was the musical part of that. Uh, I Obviously I know about the film and I know it got, it was you know, highly acclaimed when it came out and I know it, I think it did well at the box office. I'm a huge Gregory Hines fan. I love him. Uh, and you did yesterday sent me the link to that scene and that scene is one of the most intense things I, i'm going to watch the movie this weekend primarily just because that scene was so awesome what's funny to me is it very much reminds me of the scene um where they i think it's where they well it's from the godfather and my actually now i think about it, it might be godfather too but it's one of those scenes where it's the christening of mm -hmm. uh al pacino's kid yeah and they're they're uh, interposing i'm gonna use that word too i like <laughs> <it>. uh <laughs> scenes between you know this church this grand cathedral and all this very happy religious scene or you know scene work and they interpose it with these all these gangsters getting killed uh like it must be four or five different people are getting shot killed strangled whatever it may be and it, it had that same this scene has that same crazy tension and uh, which makes perfect sense because it's the same director, right? I mean, he yeah. basically uses just used his, his the same skill set in a different uh, scenario. But I'm going to watch Cotton Club. I'm embarrassed to say I haven't seen it. I think that's uh, from everything I've read, and it, from that you know, three minute scene I watched, it, it absolutely seems uh, like a must watch movie. You shouldn't and, be embarrassed. <clears throat> I've, I'm I've not embarrassed. seen a lot of movies. All <laughs> right, don't forget to rate me. Yes, I can't. I, here's what I'm going to do. I am going okay. to post facto this. I, what I can tell you is the scene that you sent me is five out of five egg burritos with sour cream. Uh, so that that's what we'll post on the website for now. Uh, but it, if I can remember, and if we don't screw up the production schedule so much, I we don't get back to it. Uh, I'm going to watch the movie and I'm going to come back and let you know if I think the whole movie is a five out of five. But that scene kicks ass and uh, I give it definitely a five out of five. Perfect. My recommendation is also a must-see film from 1984. It is the film Blood Simple by the Coen brothers. It starred Frances McDormand primarily. Dan Hedaya plays her just awful asshole husband. Uh, that's the guy from Cheers. Uh, he was Carla's husband from Cheers. He just, he's so good in this one. Um, this is the first feature film by the Coen brothers, who, in my opinion, may be the best independent filmmakers ever, at least American filmmakers. It is not my favorite Coen brothers movie. In fact, probably not even, I think I'm somewhere I have a list, which is not unusual, but I, I have a list of my favorite uh, Coen brothers movies. And I think it comes in about third or fourth, uh, but it is so well made for two, at that time, young, completely unknown guys who wrote and directed together. Uh, and it, it's it's short, it's 99 minutes, but it's 99 minutes just of tension. The visuals are so haunting. It's, it's a thriller movie. They, I think, are much more known these days for having kind of quirky humor in their films. And those are the ones I like the most. Uh, my favorite Coen Brothers movie of all time is Raising Arizona, which I believe is their second feature. So they went straight from this this kind of indie uh, um, Cinderella story of a film that was not particularly funny, but they they started to get their their footing, and um, it's 
if you like the Coen brothers and have never seen Blood Simple, you should watch it because you can see the foundation for everything they've done since then. And if you don't like the Coen brothers, it's a different film. And again, if you if you have any interest in independent cinema in America, this is one of those movies you have to see as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so my 1984 recommendation is Blood Simple, written and directed by the Coen brothers. I think at that time, the rules, uh, Directors Guild rules wouldn't allow them to be co-directors. You had to list one person. So I think Ethan, I think, I think Joel was always listed as the, the screenwriter and uh, Ethan was listed as the director or vice versa. But the reality is, is they worked so closely together. If you've ever seen an interview with those two together, they it, it's like having one mind. They just worked together. And they, interviews with actors will say it. it was just kind of the coolest experience to deal with them because they'd stand on either side of you. But it was like they were talking from the exact same brain. Uh, but anyway, uh, I digress. Blood Simple from 1984. You should watch it. Did you watch it? I did watch it. Um, awesome. I don't remember the. I don't remember uh, exactly when I watched it, but I did watch it after. It wasn't in order at all. Like I, my mm -hmm. first experience, and I think you and I watched it together, was Raising Arizona. Um, we're I think you're right. The same time. Um, we watched that movie a shit ton of times. Um, and then I watched several others. And then I realized I'd never seen the original of theirs. And I went back and watched it. And I agree, it has a very different tone. I would say, my guess is, is that you did not watch it upon my recommendation. Because that's typically not what you do. But uh, I do think we watched Raising Arizona together. And I did the same thing. I don't think I saw Blood Simple before I saw Raising Arizona. In fact, I probably saw two or three Coen Brothers movies before I went back and rented Blood Simple. And I do wish... I had seen it in the theater, and if we ever get one of those kind of uh, revival situations where the, it hits the theaters again, that's one of those movies I'll go see because I think it would be excellent on a big screen. Only because I think in comparison to a lot of other movies, it's as good as it gets, but in comparison to some of their others, I'm not able to give it a five out of five. So I'm going to give it four out of five egg burritos with sour cream. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I also think it's fair because they were just figuring their shit out. And, you know, it's not it's not their masterpiece. There are a couple of movies that I would say are tied for, you know, the Coen Brothers masterpiece. And many films probably deserve five out of five. But this one is just it is so important, I think, that it, I think it makes for a good recommendation. Why don't we go on to our uh, our season five segment, our new season five segment called Unknown Unknowns. Uh, where we try to recommend something that we don't think the audience has heard of. Uh, and we've been alternating these unknown, unknown recommendations. And this episode is your turn. It is. And I have an unknown, unknown to recommend. And I set such an incredibly low or high bar, I don't know what you want to call it, with my first unknown, unknown, because they literally had zero followers on YouTube music until I followed them. And then I think we've inspired two of our audience members to also follow them. So we've tripled their influence on YouTube music. So let's see if we can do the same thing for this guy. So I'm recommending, or sorry, I'm highlighting uh, Joe Pernice. And I'm highlighting him specifically because he's been in multiple bands, all of which I feel are underrated and underappreciated. Um, the first band and I don't remember when I introduced this one to you because I know you and I both listened to it. It was the Scud Mountain Boys. And even the title of like their first album sort of gives you an idea of the downbeat nature of their music. It's called Pine Box. Nice little coffin reference. Scud Mountain Boys were an acoustic, definite Americana, folky type of band. Almost all their stuff was downbeat or dark. Um, one of my favorite songs is called The Ride, and it's about him getting a call in the middle of the night, going to pick up a former girlfriend. Uh, it's Christmas, 1985. So close to being a perfect match with this episode. And he goes to pick her up, and one of the lines that's great is uh, he talks about he, he, held, he held his hands on the wheel when he should have been holding her hand. Um, but he didn't. He no longer had any feelings for her. And I don't know why, but I love stuff like this where it's 
I don't quite know how to describe it, but it's, he talks about a part of me is dead. And then he repeats three or four times, me is dead, me is dead, me is dead. And it almost becomes like a, you know, poorly worded line, um, but it just sticks with you because it's, it's this idea that he's feeling obviously dead inside. Um, but he does it in, in such a great, I feel like artistic way and simple way. Um, and I think that's what highlights, or sorry, highlights. I've heard, obviously, Tom, for this episode, highlights is going to be my word. Um, <laughs> that was a great magazine. But it was. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was a good magazine. <laughs> um, we used to get that in grade school. But it's what ties together all of his music is the fantastic songwriting. He is uh, from the East Coast, from Boston. Um, he has an MFA in creative writing. Uh, I think from Boston Am or University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he's continued to lead multiple bands. His latest is called the Pernice Brothers. Um, they released a new album just a couple months ago. Um, my favorite song on that one is a duet he does with uh, Nico Case, um, who mm -hmm. I like quite a bit. I think what's important here is other artists, I think, appreciate what Joe Pernice is putting out there. It's just not finding a large um, popular audience. And I think like the Pernice brothers, uh, while some of it's, you know, still downbeat in it's in the lyrics, the music is, has a happy feel to it. I mean, it's a very different sound than the Scud Mountain Boys. And the song that I like the most from that album is the, is the duet with Nico Case and it's called, I don't need that anymore. And it's two lovers um, who are really bad for each other and uh, sort of taking digs at each other as they each sing. Uh, but then they still say, you know, I, I, I was glad I had it when I did, but I don't need that anymore, which is their dysfunctional relationship. Um, and one of his, um, one of my favorite lines is after he criticizes her character in the first stanza, she comes back with, you were shy and lonely if only yeah, so sort of saying yeah right um <laughs> go check your notes because i checked mine you were some bullshitter pick of the litter always with a trophy never far behind so the you know never had a good relationship always looking for the trophy girlfriend um just some and it just all runs together so nicely he's a He's a underappreciated songwriter. I think all of his bands have important material. He's another band called Chappaquiddick Skyline, much closer to the Scud Mountain Boys. Um, but check out their uh, the Pernice Brothers' latest album, and I think if you work, if you enjoy that, work your way back to some of his other bands, and I think you'll have a nice little find there. Some good stuff, I think. I just want to point out that you can never give me shit for having a backup recommendation again. Because you what? just recommended four <laughs> different uh, perform artists. You recommended Joe Pernice, who I didn't know had a solo album or a career, and clearly he yep. does. The Pernice Brothers, who I know because of you, and Scud Mountain Boys, and then Chappaquiddick Skyline. So that's four recommendations <laughs> in the space of about two minutes. So I don't want to ever hear that I had a backup and, and catch it for it. I'm just saying right now. Uh, All right. You but introduced you know me... What? What? <laughs> he has another band too. <laughs> uh, called, and I I never listened to them. They're called the <laughs> New Mendicants. So I can't uh, recommend them because I've never listened to them, but I'm going to after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Scud Mountain Boys, you introduced me to, and I thought it was earlier than it was because what I remember is the album Massachusetts. Yep. And that came out in 1996. And I think that's the first I ever heard of them. So that was actually after I graduated law school. So I'm thinking it was part of our traveling mixtape. You must have sent me Scud Mountain Boys yeah. songs that way. And I started listening uh, to him and to them at that point. I listened to Pernice Brothers. Again, you've put uh, their music on mixes that we've exchanged in the past. I want to listen to his solo stuff. I'm really interested in doing that. And I'm a huge Nico Case fan. Uh, so that song I haven't heard, but I'm going to play as soon as we're done recording. So, uh, although it's, I'm not sure which one you recommended, frankly, um, all four of them seem like, uh, unknown unknowns that are worth listening to. I think you could combine all of his various bands together and still have less, um, yes. than like followers, you know, less followers than 
uh, some of these artists out there get in like five minutes on YouTube. So <laughs> that's I'm sure that's true. And I do yeah. I do really like Scud Mountain Boys. So I'm going to check out all yeah. the other stuff as well. And we recommend that our, our listeners do as well. That takes us now to Post Facto. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. This is where we like to uh, correct any errors we may have made, fill in the blanks from earlier episodes. Uh, I have uh, got really one thing to to post facto specifically uh, by myself, but you and I both need to correct a grievous error from our sitcom episode. And um, as we mentioned in this episode, we uh, this season we are rating each other's recommendations for that particular episode. And we both made recommendations, but neither of us made or gave our egg burritos with sour cream rating. So uh, I recommended the Men at Work album Cargo, which came out in 1983. And uh, I went on at length about how much I like Colin Hay, but we didn't get your recommend or your uh, rating for that album. So if I could give it four and a half stars, I would, because the album itself is outstanding, as you said. How you tied it into the episode was even better. But I'm going to hold back. I mean, you did a really nice job of, I mean, he literally performed in the in the series that you talked about, um, the sitcom that we talked about. So I'm going to give it four out of five, but it's way closer to five out of five than it uh, would be because you did such a good job wow. complimenting you of presenting it and tying it to the theme of the show. I'm going to let Colin Hay know that he uh, uh, that I got him almost to a five out of five. Uh, your recommendation last episode uh, for when we talked about sitcoms was the sitcom The Jeffersons, and uh, my egg burritos with sour cream rating for The Jeffersons is four out of five egg burritos. Uh, great, great sitcom. Listen to it all the time. I I don't make it a five, and that's only because we spent that episode talking about the greatest sitcoms of, of all time. And uh, I don't think it makes that top tier. It's probably not one of my top 10, uh, but it, it definitely had a huge place in my life back then. And that's kind of how you discussed it was, you know, was you know, coming home from, from school and watching it, watching it with your family when it first came out. I was the same way and just really, really funny and really an example of a spinoff that you almost forget was a spinoff because the characters were so original and the storyline was so was very, very different than uh, the show that it came from, which was all in the family. And then I agree. That's a, that's a good, that's a fair assessment. The other thing that I want to talk about uh, as far as post facto is concerned is that we had a coming of age episode. I believe it may have been in our prior season, season four. Now I can't remember. We recently posted uh, back in October a blog, which was really just a way for me to get out of writing a blog for that week. Uh, but we posted an essay my son Jake wrote for, high, for his, one of his high school classes, his rhetoric class, that was a breakdown of the movie Rushmore. And I'm very proud of it. I think he did a really, really nice job. And uh, I'm, I was excited to put it up on the site. And you can find it now if you go to thirdsonginpodcast.com. But it is really about uh, a coming-of-age movie I should have brought up when we talked about coming-of-age films uh, back in that episode. Rushmore is a fantastic coming-of-age story about this quirky dude who uh, gets event gets kicked out of the private school that he loves. Uh, and I won't go into giving a complete summary of the movie, but uh, my son Jake does a really nice breakdown of how the director used uh, certain visual cues and uh, rhetoric, rhetorical styles to uh, focus on this character of Max Fisher in the movie Rushmore. So first of all, I'm recommending you go back and read Jake's article and uh, you should also watch the movie Rushmore. Which I haven't, uh, the second one, I've not watched the movie Rushmore. I did read Jake's uh, blog, really good. Kid is well-prepared for college. I People always ask, you know, what's the most important thing? You know, what major should you choose? I stand by the fact that being a good writer, being able to communicate effectively is the most important skill that you can bring to college because so few kids do. Jake's got it figured out. That was a great essay. Yeah, I was I was really proud of him for that. And what's really funny is if you ask Jake, he'll tell you that uh, his twin brother, Tommy, is a better writer than him. Mm -hmm. But uh, Tommy won't let me read any of his stuff. 
<laughs> he just he writes it, he turns it in, he gets an A. I figure, well, I'm not gonna mess with, I'm not gonna fix what ain't broke. But I'm working on Tommy. He wrote uh, an, an essay for the same class, which was also a breakdown of a movie. Um, and I've asked him if he'll let me use it. Uh, and again, it's mainly because I'm lazy because I want to get, you know, I want to substitute it for one of my articles at some point. But if I can get Tommy to do it, then uh, we may get another one later down the line. And that brings us to staff picks. Staff Picks is Tom and I's attempt to recreate um, the experience of going to a record store or a video store, DVD store, whatever you want to call it, um, where up on some board or chalkboard or whatever, you get the recommendations from the folks that work there. It is often be new material um, that they wanted to introduce to folks who came in. Tom and I would often, or I would as much, I know that I did, I'm sure he did too, would just, you know, go to the board go check it out. And sometimes those would pay off into lifelong listening. I struggled this week. I, I, I We need to stop recording on Fridays because a bunch of shit just hit the new yeah. release on YouTube. And um, I would have chosen three or four things over what I chose. But I'm going with a band I'd never heard of until this week. It's a duet, two guys uh, called Laden Valley. And they have three singles released on YouTube Music. I listened to them all. They do not have an album or an EP yet, so they're very much in their infancy as far as their um, release of music. And the three songs are Angeline, Angeline, I'm not sure. Uh, that's a good, solid song. And Desert Rain, which is an okay song. It's, I don't know, it's also a very cliched title. But the one that I liked quite a bit is a is a um, collaboration with another band that I listened to called The Ballroom Thieves. And that one is There Was a Light. It just highlights they're a very stripped down, folky uh, sounding group. Don't have a lot more to say other than that. I think uh, I would recommend it because I love the guy's voice. And I don't even know how to describe. I listened to probably 10 other albums and the music of some of them would was probably a little bit better, but the voices just didn't hit me. And these, the way that these two harmonize, um, the tone of their voices struck me and I'm giving them benefit of the doubt that they'll build upon the strength of a song like There Was a Light um, versus I thought Desert Rain was a little weak. Check out those three singles and hopefully it leads to a, a nice solid first album from this, these two. All right, I have a small correction because I'm looking on Apple Music, and I don't know what if this I means wrong? they. I, I show an album from 2021. Oh fuck, it is on there. Uh, well, what's interesting is I wonder if it's this, it's got to be yeah. the same band. They don't even have their singles on here. Yeah, I, I was just singles. looking at the same thing, but I again because I didn't, I don't know them either. All right, so this is a quick post facto that I need to research more. There is a album. In fact, there's two. There's two EPs by Laden Valley on YouTube Music. But what's interesting is it doesn't have their newest singles. So I'm almost wondering if it's the same band. But let's go with this. I'm going to recommend Laden Valley's three latest singles. Check them out and then go back and listen to these earlier albums and see if it's the same band or not. If it is, I will say something in our in our next post facto. Yeah, yeah. The the I see an album from 2021 called Landline. Uh, yep, but let's we're going to start with that. Uh, let's start with that. The, those three songs. I haven't listened to them. I I also will report back in post facto and let you know what I think. Which takes me to my staff pick. Uh, there's an album that came out about a week or mm, no, I'm sorry. It came back. It came out in September of 2024. I realized it was out about a week ago. Uh, it's an album by Hayes and the Heathens, which is a what I will loosely call an Americana supergroup uh, of Hayes Carl and Band of Heathens, uh, both really good uh, alt country uh, Americana type bands. Uh, I'm a giant, giant Hayes Carl fan, a little less of a Band of Heathens fan, but I like them a lot. Uh, I don't know how I missed that this came out because I, I look for, you know, I'm always looking for new Hayes Carl stuff. So it's a self-titled album called Hayes and the Heathens. 
Uh, it has a very old school outlaw country vibe to me. Uh, I feel like it's kind of Merle Haggard-ish, kind of uh, Waylon Jennings, kind of Willie Nelson. Um, as I said before, Hayes Carl is one of my favorites. You should listen to all of his stuff. But as far as my staff pick is concerned, this new album by Hayes and the Heathens, really, really good. Love the opening track, which uh, is titled Nobody Dies from Weed. Uh, so I recommend it. I, uh, I don't think you've listened to it yet. Chris, but uh, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say when you do. You know what I have to say is I was researching when you looked and two things. I will listen to that album because I do like um, both of those artists, groups of artists, the band. But I think Leighton Valley is messed up on YouTube music. They have two separate entries for them that mm. doesn't. But when I went to Spotify, everything's together on one. So at some point, I'm sure YouTube will get their stuff together. But so I'm right. standing by the fact that they caused me to fuck up. It's not my fault. Yeah, no, I uh, and I have no idea how I'm going to edit all that shit together. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's going to happen. All right. So let's hope I don't fuck up our playlist picks as bad as I did this one. Although I have concerns about my playlist pick. So <laughs> which does bring us to our playlist picks for this episode for all seasons of third song in tom and i create a playlist um, we each pick a song that should tie into the theme of the episode try to be not too obvious in our picks and um, all of these playlists are available on the major streaming services so youtube music amazon music apple music and spotify my pick for the playlist for episode four is a song that came out in 1984. And I, all right, so I just gave you shit for backups <clears throat> and alternate picks. I had a hard time. 1984 it turns out was a great year for uh, singles for me. I had to decide between picking a song from the sexiest woman on the planet in that time, uh, possibly the sexiest man on the planet, uh, or the creepiest man of 1984. One of the songs I thought about was Heartbeat City uh, by The Cars. Rick Ocasek, uh, who passed away not too long ago, was a great musician, but one of the strangest looking dudes I've ever seen. In my life. I thought about Summer of 69 uh, from the album Reckless by Brian Adams. You know, he, I love that song. That was one of the songs that was on the radio constantly. Uh, but it really, for me, it always comes down to sexy women. It was either going to be Tina Turner or Sade. God, did I love those women. My choice, though, for the playlist is going to be Better Be Good to Me from the album Private Dancer, which I listened to constantly in 1984, 85, 86, uh, by Tina Turner. Uh, she, is, she is, she was one of the greatest live performers you've ever seen, one of the greatest singers, she has such a great voice, and uh, I really, really enjoy that song. So Better Be Good to Me from Private Dancer. Chris, what is your playlist pick? Well, I didn't struggle and have 27 backups like you did, but I did struggle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at first I was going to go with a Micah Schneib Schnabel song. Um, mm -hmm. He's the lead singer at Two Cow Garage. He does a remake of a Replacements song, which I like quite a bit. But that was from a 1986 album, not 1984. So it didn't seem like an exact match. The replacements did have an important album in 84. They had a song from that album called Androgynous, um, which Crash Test Dummies did a great version of. I think I was a little afraid of the song Androgynous because I never quite know what's going to get us in trouble with some of this stuff. So I, <laughs> even though I like that song, I decided not to go with it. So what I did go with is a song that has definite meaning to me there's certainly a story i can tell about it but it's not going to be a great addition to our playback <laughs> it's just not a <laughs> our, not our playback our playlist um i'm going with a song from 1984's the warning by queens uh the song is entitled n m 156 it the importance to me is i actually wrote an essay on it in college in this almost like musicology type class. Everyone else was writing about Bob Dylan and everyone else. I told my professor I was going to write about Queensryche. 
and he was very skeptical. And then I turned it, <laughs> turned in the essay and he really liked it a lot. He said he was shocked that it ended up being, um, you know, as good as it was. I mean, I am into music and that's why we're doing this podcast, but I don't remember what I wrote about, but I got it. I, it, it came back to the house and I, I came back to the house and I put it in our ma my mailbox downstairs, which is just a little, um, you know, box, you know, a little shelf of stuff. Someone pulled it out and saw it and read it and uh, from the house. I can't remember who it was. And they're like, I didn't realize you were smart. I was like, <laughs> so, like, but that's one of the best essays I've ever written or read. And I was like, oh, cool. I mean, the song, the song itself, um, you can hear the beginnings of what was probably their most important album, which is Operation Mindcrime. Um, it's this idea of uh, machines taking over. Um, it starts with a very machine like voice and then it does pick up in the, in the, the pace of the song. So it, it has a, it'll be fine on the playlist. It's just definitely not going to flow very, um, fantastic from a Tina Turner song. So <laughs> well, that's it, it is what it is. It does have meaning to me. It was the beginnings of my affection for the band Queensryche, um, who I no longer listen to because they're not even the same band anymore, but I think that they did do some important stuff, even though it's sort of prog metal, which isn't usually my thing, but I do like them. Geez, I wish you had that essay. Uh, you could have put that I do too. I, I'm listening to the song. I'm like, what the hell did I write about? Because <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, uh, that's, 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 that's our playlist. So, All right. That brings us to the end of this episode. You can email us at thirdsongin at gmail.com. Please follow us rate and review our podcast wherever you listen to them. Give us all your stars. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and YouTube Music. Check out our website, thirdsonginpodcast.com. Continuing to add material to it daily. You can uh, find links to the playlist that we talked about. Um, you can listen to the podcast directly from the site. And you can also check out our blogs, including Jake's. Um, from the week that we recorded this episode. We have a Facebook page. You can find us under Third Song In on Facebook. That's a great way to communicate with us as well. Uh, we also uh, tend to post links to the blog, to the episodes as they come out, and sometimes to we put up little funny pictures. You've been listening to Third Song In with Chris Derrickson and Tom Polichek. Thanks for listening. You've been you listening. Funny pictures. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with me? I'm just rambling on about some bullshit. <laughs> Cut all that shit out. That brings us to staff picks. Let's go. We are taking a break because Chris got a phone call. There is very, very important business going on right now. He's pacing. He's gesturing with his hand. He's holding the cell phone away from his ear. He's clearly exasperated. He's walked off screen. And I think it would be hilarious if right now and then you just saw the phone go sailing back the other way across the screen. But nope, now he's back in. Uh, now he's back out. I am definitely cutting this and putting it into a stinger in some way, shape, or form. Uh, he's raised one finger to me. It's just going to be a minute, he thinks. Probably just, just a few seconds more. Uh, I can't hear him because he's not near the microphone. He's definitely directing. He's, he's doing some important uh, vice president type stuff right now. Just staring at the phone. Uh, I'm guessing he's swearing, at least under his breath. He's he's pacing, just in and out of the uh, the view of the camera. And he is now he's hung up the phone and he's put his headphones back on. And Shut up. he's 